Abuzid concludes his introduction with several final comments. First, without alluding to his persecution in Egypt, Abuzid mentions the publication of the German translation of his autobiography in 1999 and an inv invitation extended to him uh, by a German publisher requesting him to write a new book on Ibn Arabi which would be more suitable for a general readership than his doctoral thesis. Abuzid actually began to write the book in English for the sake of convenience in translating it into German, but he quickly realized it would be better to write it in his native Arabic, somewhat to the discomfiture of the publisher. Second, Abuzid was delighted when Professor Anne-Marie Schimmel, the celebrated authority on the study of Sufism, offered to translate the book herself from Arabic to German, although this unfortunately did not come to pass. I should remark parenthetically that this was a remarkable offer since Professor Schimmel ordinarily maintained that she didn't really understand Ibn Arabi, but she liked Abu Zaid's approach so much that she wanted to assist in any case. As a third point, Abu Zaid relates that he completed the book in June of 2001, only a short time before the events of September 11, 2001, which, as he remarks, reverberate in the preface that follows. While Professor Schimmel was to him an example of faith in the unity of human civilization from the perspective of spiritual experience, the contrary and highly ideological notion of the clash of civilizations was predominating at this point in Europe and America. In his only reference to the book's title, Abu Zaid says, thus spake Ibn Arabi about civilizations, cultures, and religions. This is the subject of the book which I was honored to introduce to the Arab reader. And the book finally appeared in Arabic in 2002. In his preface, Abu Zaid turns to the question, why Ibn Arabi today? It is here that he presents his brief analysis of the factors motivating the spiritual quest, particularly the anxiety, the high technology, and the injustice that are such prominent features of modernity. He relates the enlightenment to cultural uh, relativism, the rise of individuality and capitalism, and these in turn are linked to the colonial mentality and the binary opposition between the civilized and the barbaric. He remarks that the response of the Christian churches to the Enlightenment was to turn outward in the form of missionary activity, naturally arousing an anti-colonial feeling. At this time, Islam became, as he puts it, a spiritual capital that supplied the revolutionary symbols for the struggle against colonialism. So Islam became a kind of local formula for seeking justice. Thus arose a case of local cultures arrayed against the global north, since the global market has become the new god. As might be expected, Abu Zaid cites the writings of Fukuyama on the supposed apocalypse of capitalism and the fulminations of Huntington on the clash of civilizations. Abu Zaid describes the current status of Asian civilizations as in conflict with modernity, although he does not raise here the general topic of fundamentalism as a revolt against the ideologies of modernism. He depicts secularism as the new religion of market and power, which brooks no resistance. For him, the god of secularism is like Dracula, a mighty idol that is immune to traditional religion. Here, Abu Zaid raises the problem of the return to religion in today's environment, but which religion? Religion has taken on a social dimension of duty, but it also contains the inner dimension of spiritual experience. He sees Sufism as a revolt against the religious establishment, a tendency distinct from the formal disciplines of theology and law. Now, Abu Zaid sketches out the position of Ibn Arabi between his predecessors and his adherents. He notes, his connection to world heritage and, referring to the studies of Izutsu and Asin Palacios, he comments on the profound impact of Ibn Arabi on other thinkers. Ibn Arabi is important both for preserving his lost predecessors through quotations in his own writings and for his impact on later Sufi tradition. The appeal of Ibn Arabi, like that of other figures of spirituality in every culture, is the model that he furnishes of spiritual experience as an inspiring resource for our world today. In this respect, the arts offer a similar solution as well. Abu Zaid cautions, however, that Salafi control poses an obstacle to the quest for spiritual experience 
as likewise the mass media that represent Islam as anti-modern and terrorist. In this dual attack from inside and outside, the elements of philosophy, theology, and literature have been excised from Islam so that only terrorism and the veil remain. In such a situation where the clash of civilizations has become government policy, intellectuals are striving for dialogue. The two main purposes for studying Ibn Arabi are thus to free the contemporary Muslim intellect and simultaneously to show another face of Islam to non-Muslims. <clears throat> Let me turn briefly to the category of spiritual experience since this forms an important concept in Abu Zaid's approach to this topic. In chapter one, which is a brief biography of Ibn Arabi, he raises the question of the beginning point of Ibn Arabi's spiritual career. Uh, Dr. Claude Das, from whom we heard a, a very nice paper yesterday in her monumental study of Ibn Arabi, uh, has been followed by other scholars in using passages from Ibn Arabi's writings to suggest that his fundamental spiritual experience took place during a retreat that occurred as early as the year 1184, the same year in which he encountered the philosopher Ibn Rushd, and also the date of his entry into the path. This is an astonishingly early date for this spiritual formation, given that he would have been approximately 15 years old, or 20 years old, if we follow Osman Yahya's dating of the meeting. Many accounts of this early retreat have been phrased in a hagiographical tone, suggesting that Ibn Arabi at this time attained a vast spiritual knowledge through unveiling without the benefit of study, which he would be elaborating for the rest of his life. While noting this information, Abu Zaid focuses instead on a different autobiographical account in which Ibn Arabi relates an event from his youth when he participated in a hunting expedition seeking wild onagers. He discovered that he could not take part in harming the animals and therefore refused to hunt. Abu Zaid observes that this episode demonstrates the inherent goodness and compassion of Ibn Arabi's heart and that this attitude was not dependent upon formal religious faith. Ibn Arabi later explained that it was by adding mystical knowledge to his goodness of heart that he intuitively recognized the divine secret in all. So in bypassing the hagiographic description of the youthful retreat of Ibn Arabi, it seems to me that Abu Zayd has chosen to represent him in a less esoteric fashion than usual. He depicts the crucial moment in Ibn Arabi's development in terms of a universally accessible moment of compassion rather than from a mystical gnosis uniquely granted to Ibn Arabi. From a methodological point of view, it's noteworthy, uh, and I'm going to summarize this section here just to save a little bit of time, that Abu Zaid uses the category of spiritual experience uh, to signify a direct expression of unmediated encounter with divine realities without benefit of any rationalization or translation. And I would just like to remark that the term experience has a history, going back to the Renaissance and, uh, and an anti-authoritarian 